Hey, hey Mung Beans. Beans. I'm Joey. I'm Ashley. And, and this, this is Wine Time Mysteries. Mysteries. If you're into true crime, and if the paranormal gets your nips hard, then this is for you. But before we get started, make sure to follow us on Spotify and stalk us on Insta and TikTok. Or send your inquiries to winetimemysteries at gmail.com and we promise to at least try to get back to you. Let go! I'm not even going to try. Why? Look at me. You're right. Yeah. So all the listeners know, you know, I just quit my job a, a few weeks back. It's officially been a week. Yeah. And I've just gone into my full bogan self. feel like I'm having a midlife crisis at 30. Nah. She's just living her best life. Just living my best life. Except I nearly left the house with no shoes. You're welcome. Who are we here to talk about this week? Oh, wouldn't you like to know? Well, today I'm talking about John Emil List. That's who I'm talking about. John Emil List was born 17th of September, 1925 in Bay City, Michigan, US of A. Not in Australia. Uh-uh. That's exciting. Mm, I bet you're excited. I am moist, like a moist cupcake. Ew, that's disgusting. Which also makes him a Virgo, mm. which I don't know a lot about Virgos, so maybe that's saying something. Virgos are okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe they're just... Normally. Normal. He was the only child to German-American parents John Frederick List and Alma Barbara Florence List. Was their uncle's name Schindler? <laughs> you can't say that. Oh. No, you can, but you can't say that. <laughs> this was a little fun fact I chucked in there. He was 28 years older than his wife, just because I wanted to. I like to find out how old everyone is. And she had John when she was 38. Oh. Yeah, so a bit older. Yeah. He was a bit older and she was a bit older, so why not? His upbringing was raised under the views of a strict religious background, but he said he embraced this wholeheartedly. Because, you know, some kids are forced into it, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Let's not get into that. So, normalish upbringing, apparently. He was said to be somewhat cold with little friends, so to me, just keeps to himself. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how we're going today. Whatever. Whatever. Uh, now, List was a devout Lutheran and Sunday school teacher. And when he was 18, he enlisted in the United States Army and served as a lab tech hmm. during World War II. He was discharged. Ew. He was discharged in 1946. Oh, discharged. Now, I'm going to be super dumb because I originally put, but why? Do you know what date that is? 1946, yeah. So I don't know, maybe the war had finished a year mm-hmm. before. So maybe that's why he got discharged. At when least I said, corrected myself. True. When you said 46, I was like, well, it makes sense. That's when it ended. And in um, my, when I was researching this, I was like, oh, uh, why? I couldn't, and I actually wrote down, I couldn't find why. Oh, Because <laughs> the war was ending, you dumb bitch. But anyway, he would later enroll in uni where he received a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in accounting. Oh, and also was commissioned a second lieutenant through reserve officers training. And I bet he ended up leaving university once he graduated and we just didn't know why. So you had to... <laughs> I, was, I was actually listening going, oh my God, okay, where is this going? <laughs> Fucking bitch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wish you could have seen my face. I was like, oh, yeah? Oh. I don't know anything about this guy. You bitch. He's, he's a dick. <laughs> Sorry. Bit of a, just bit more of a dick than you are today. That's fine. I don't think so. (laughs) Is this what is called karma for me being a bitch to the last however many episodes? Now in November 1950, List, who was now 25, was recalled to active military services as the Korean War escalated. He was stationed at Fort Eustis, Virginia, where he would meet his future wife, Helen Morris Taylor. She was a widow of an in infantry officer who was killed in action in Korea and lived nearby with her daughter Brenda. Now, unfortunately, she mm, poor choice of words. She did have a son. Unfortunately, (laughs) she had a child. Yeah. No, because how it goes. I was like, probably don't. Yeah. I was like, she did have a son to her previous husband as well. And his name was Kenneth Everett Taylor, but he passed away when he was nine weeks old. And there wasn't a lot on him as well. Now, after a short time being together, they decided to wed on December 1st, 1951. So just around a year of being together. I did see a few times something around this. So I must say, allegedly, it was said that Helen had tricked John into the marriage by telling him she was preggers. And that is something that people still use to this day. Oh, yeah. The amount of times I tell my guy friends, be careful. 
some girls just want to trap you and they're like what and i'm like yeah it's a That's thing true. it is a thing apparently he found out after and was furious however he was a man about whoever it is and his vows mean more than that obviously they stayed together so i think maybe he might not have proposed so quick if because i think given his upbringing that's why he was like oh better be married to have kids and as a female and obviously you've never done this yourself i don't i I just don't understand but i i hope not (laughs) is that something that women do when they feel like their relationship might be rocky or ending or that the guy's gonna leave that's when they chuck out that i'm pregnant i'm sure i've heard stories about people that were in good relationships that have lied about it Mm. It's kind of a baby band-aid and then also just to trap the guy if they think they've got it good and they don't want them to leave. True. So it doesn't have to be bad, but maybe they're trying to get a wedding proposal or Mm -hmm. marriage proposal. To be like, I got you now, motherfucker. Mm, Yeah. So it can kind of be a bit of everything. I can't use that. What? Well, I can't go up to my man and be like, (laughs) babe, I'm pregnant. And he'll be like, yeah, I loaded you last night, but... (laughs) You can't actually get pregnant, you dumb fuck. And I'll be like, well, what is this? And I'll be like, <laughs> you're just pregnant. fat. Oh. That's right. I just digressed all over this place. It's fine. Shortly after the wedding, they relocated to Northern California, where he was reassigned to the finance core. Just sitting over there like, yeah, okay, no. <laughs> I'm like trying to engage with you and you're like, no, okay. Um, due to his accounting skills. Can I not just sit here and smile at you while you no. talk? Is that Okay. <laughs> Now, also, I just wanted to drop a little something, something that always comes up, like the comment I made before about the old up the duff. But apparently old love had the old siffy sif sif from her previous <laughs> husband. Yes. And hadn't told old mate John. So that's another hidden secret. So once again, another strain to add. But can't you tell if you have, aren't there visual signs for syphilis? Yeah, look, I don't know. For syphilis? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure if she knew she had it or she was just keeping it from him. Mm. I'm not 100% sure, but it wasn't until around 1969 when her condition worsened and that's when he found out. Good number. Mm. 69, not for her. Now, there wasn't a lot of info as to what, but Helen was now said to have been a completely different person, became an alcoholic, as well as quoted as being unstable. So maybe she did know and then was just kind of Mm self-medicating with alcohol. Not 100% sure, but yes. I found one article that said she went from an attractive young woman to a messy and paranoid recluse. Um, She also hated on John a lot even saying at social events how much he was less endowed than her previous husband. Oh, nice. Yeah, like, okay, listen, Linda, your previous husband gave you the sif. Syphilis. See? Syphilis. Syphilis. Yeah, maybe don't complain. Yeah, like, okay. Maybe he was packing like a horse, Mm, but but he he got you sick. Yeah, with the sif. With the sif lord. With the sif lord. Fuck. So 1952, John completes his second tour and takes a job with an accounting firm and would move to a position as an audit supervisor at a paper company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That's a real place? Yeah. Can we go to Kalamazoo? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, Kalamazoo. In between this time, as he rose through the ranks of his company, they would have three children being Patricia List, born 1955, John List Jr. in 1956, and in 1958 was Frederick List. Now, Helen's first child, Brenda, from her previous marriage, would marry and move out by about 1960. So this time the family would then move to Rochester, New York, where John then took a job with Xerox. Shut up. (laughs) Uh, He remained there until 1965, where he became the director of accounting services. In 1965, he would then accept a vice president position at a bank in Jersey City, New Jersey. Like this guy is just jobs left, right and center, just moving everywhere. But yeah, being in this position, you'd think he was rolling in the dough. (laughs) He purchased a 19 room Victorian mansion called Breeze Knoll. I oh. would change that name so fucking quickly. <laughs> I wrote down, I was like, oh yeah, mate, I'll just live at Breeze Knoll. Breeze Knoll. <laughs> just bogan up a name. What is a knoll? A small hill or mound. You have a breezy mound. <laughs> <laughs> My breeze mound. Oh, I felt a bit of breeze through my mound. Oh, the river's running. Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, 
I'm <laughs> sorry, not sorry, <laughs> which was in Westfield, New Jersey. And seeing as though they had 19 rooms, his mother came and lived with him. So, oh, fuck off. Yeah, I didn't actually look to see if they'd separated or if the father passed away, yada, yada, yada. But there was just too much in this story. I just couldn't be fucked. Can you imagine if the dad was still alive and they're like, nah, you're not coming, but <laughs> yeah. mom, mom, you My- can move in. <laughs> So the kids start growing into teenagers and it's reported Helen becomes more unstable now. Remember, it was in 1969 when John found out she had, is it tertiary syphilis? I actually had a look into what it was, but it's known as being the late stage of the STD. I didn't even know. So damage can now be to their eyes, hearing, bones, nervous system, and even heart. I did have a look and it is treatable. Not too sure about back then because I'm lazy. I didn't kind of have a look. But if treatment is delayed, it could be irreversible. So this is where I'm like, did she actually know or who knows? Who knows? But then also if she went to a doctor to get treated for cephalis, Mm. then that's probably going to be on a permanent record too, right? Yeah, well, it was only in 1969, I think, when she started to, like, deteriorate that mm. he took her to the doctors and he's like, oh, yeah, you got the siffy. The siffy. It was stated that after the move to Breeze Knoll, Helen began having blackouts, vision issues, and just unstable in general. It was said she was self-medicating, again, by this stage, even though she was kind of drinking before anyway. So self-medicating with drinking and such, and was also mentioned apparently she stopped going to church. So that would have been a big thing for old Johnny boy. I mean, I don't blame her. Now, in addition to the issues with his wife's health now declining pretty quickly, John started becoming concerned about his children. It was mentioned a lot. He thought it was a disgusting, sinful time. And for him, the cherry on the cake was his daughter wanting to become an actress, which was just sinful as fuck. In his eyes, he was not happy. It was stated he started to worry that his family would not get into heaven. Fuck the syphilis. What's doing it for you is the acting? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does it sound like I'm starting to do the build up to the big day? It does. Mm, Good, because I am. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) All right. So John is struggling with his wife, now his kids, and the possibility of them not following the path of his beliefs. John then loses his high paying job at the bank less than a year after starting. Now, do you think he told his family that he lost his job? No, no, he did not. This MF, oh, fuck it, would... (laughs) pretend to go to work every day so it was said he would just chill out at the station read nap you know that old thing Mm. get dressed for work every day and just go hang out at the train station because same he did eventually get another job that paid less however he would lose this job as well so it was just kind of struggling to keep jobs down so yeah struggling to keep jobs down and he apparently even started skimming money off his mother's account Hmm. so 1971 John List was now bankrupt. The house they had moved into was already living well above their needs. Now, being a man of the Lord, you'd think material things wouldn't mean much to him, but I did see reports that apparently Helen pushed for it, which to me kind of makes a bit of sense because why would a man of God want a 19-room mansion? Have you ever watched those, probably not, but those Christian TV shows that are on like every Sunday morning? No. From America? No. They're all wearing like Cartier jewelry. Like it's crazy. Really? Yeah. But I thought, mm. Mm-hmm. okay, let's just not get into that, shall we? <laughs> now add everything up and the fact that he was going to be facing the humiliation of admitting to his family that they were financially broke, as well as his thoughts that his family was becoming morally bankrupt as well. John List saw only one option. He would kill his family mm. while they could still make it into heaven. Sounds about right. Yeah. So by killing his family, he hoped to spare them shame, save their souls, and guarantee they could all spend the afterlife together. But one of the commandments, I believe, in general is thou shalt not kill, right? Mm. So they're going to be all up there if you believe in that. Mm. Where are you going to be, buddy? Yeah. Which is a nice segue because I was going to say he chose not to commit suicide because he considered it a sin. But murder. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was just going to be the hero, can I say that? Um, (laughs) Just without the guilt, like as in, you know, he's saving his family. And yeah, once once you go in a bit more, you'll be like, "Mm, that's exactly what he would have been thinking. On November 9th, 1971, 
John started his day as he normally would. Kids went off to school and Helen, now 46, was seated in the kitchen having a coffee when List approached her from behind and shot her in the back of the head. He placed her body on a sleeping bag and dragged her into the ballroom. Yes, they had a motherfucking ballroom. So next, John headed upstairs to the apartment of his mother, Alma, who was 84. She was having breakfast, kissing her on the head. She was executed with a single shot above the left eye. She was too heavy to move, so he places a towel over her face and just leaves her there. So I think they were all shot from the back, but it must have, I'm just making motions that no one else can see. It's just like kind of come out underneath her eye, just to be a bit more graphic. Now, while he was waiting for the kids to come home from school, it was said he took a little break, making himself lunch, went to the bank to close his account, and cash his mother's savings bond. He also contacted his kids' teachers to let them know the family was leaving to take care of a sick relative in North Carolina. He even had their mail and newspapers and milk all cancelled. Planning. When his daughter Patricia, now 16, and son Frederick, now 13, came home from school, he shot them as well in the back of the head. So all of them didn't know it was coming. Then John drove to his then 15-year-old son John Jr.'s soccer game where he sat and watched his son play before driving him home and shooting him. What a piece of shit. Now, John Jr. was shot around 10 times as it was said John saw him twitching after the first shot. So he just kept shooting until he just laid still. Placing all of the family members in the ballroom, except for his mother, who was upstairs, as I said before, it was said he cleaned up, made and ate his dinner, did the dishes and went to bed. Now, the following day, John turned down the air conditioning, turned on the lights and some classical music and wrote a full confession out to his past making note this is not funny I'm sorry I'm just the pasta part pasta part making note of his mother in the attic saying she was too heavy to move he also cut himself out of all the family portraits so police would not have a photo for the wanted poster he then drove to John F Kennedy International Airport in New York where he left his car as a false lead and took a bus into the city clever man bit planned out don't you think Mm -hmm. so a month has now passed and people are starting to get suspicious the constant burning lights and empty windows at the manor Authorities were called on December 7, 1971, where they would make the gruesome discovery. The partially decomped remains of Elmer, Helen, Patricia, Frederick and John Jr., as well as the note from John detailing the murders and why he did it. Of course, by now, he was long gone. After taking the bus to New York City, as I said before, he then took a train to Denver, Colorado. By the time they had discovered everything, the trail of where he now was had gone cold. So now I'm going to fast forward to 18 years later to a little section I'm going to call art and science, bitch. Now, do you know a show called America's Most Wanted? I do. (sighs) So do I. Well, detectives must have been reviewing the case or some shit around that time. And they went to producers and were like, oi, put this one on the television, please. Because that's exactly what they said. No, that's not what they said, but... And in an Australian accent, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Oi, you, over there. Put it on. Uh, as you know, people were actually getting captured from this show. Now, I didn't realise, but the host got involved after his six-year-old son, Adam, was a duck... Uh, bleh, was a duck? Was a duck? He was found a- out he was fucking a duck, and his son <laughs> was a duckling. Duckling. Oh. My God. But yeah, I didn't realize his, the host, six-year-old son, Adam, was abducted from a Sears department store and found dead two weeks later. And that's why he started America's Most Wanted. Did you know that? I did not. That is news to me. Mm. Because I just thought it was like trash TV. Well. Um, This case had managed to go unrecognized for almost two decades. So Walsh reached out to forensic sculptor Frank Bender to create a bust of how this would look like now as it was 1989. Hey, big bender. (laughs) I was waiting for (laughs) what you were going to (laughs) say. But yeah, I didn't even know it was a thing. And I'll show you a picture of this bust and we'll post it on the Instagrams. But it is uncanny and you've got to watch how he makes it. This episode aired The List Murders on May 21, 1989 to an audience of 22 million people. As I said before, you really need to look at it like at the bust. He just went off the psychological profile and pics from his parents and then they even went to the point of being like, you know, he's held on to these murders for 18 years now. What kind of lines would it make on his face from holding that? And I was just like, what? Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Even down to they were like, oh, you know, he'd still be wearing glasses because he wore glasses. FYI. Um, But they were like, you know, he's not vain enough to wear contacts and it's him to a T. 
Kentucky. It's insane. Uh, one tip did come through from a neighbor who thought the person they lived next uh, next door to looked just like him, and his name was Robert Clark. The tip, the uh, the tit. Oh, the tit. The titster, the tipster, said the neighbor was also an accountant and attended church. Rot row. Like, you ain't even trying to hide. But I guess you kind of did for 18 years, so hey. Now, Robert Clark was also married. So let's do a bit of a rundown of that fun 18 years of freedom. So as I said, he went from New Jersey to Michigan and then to Colorado. By early 1972, he had settled in Denver and began using the name of a previous college classmate, Robert Clark, who it was said later on he didn't even know who List was. Apparently List knew him. He once again got an accounting job and joined a a Lutheran congregation where he would meet an army PX clerk named Dolores Miller and he married her in 1985. So List was arrested at work on June 1, less than two weeks after the broadcast. His wife would end up divorcing him because fuck that noise, she didn't know. Anyway, List stood by his, I'm Bob Clark, I'm not John List. Blah, 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 for a few months but evidence came through that would tie him to it all the fingerprints and such just everything like he laid out a full confession and yeah he confessed to his true identity on february 16th 1990 so during the trial the defense lawyers argued he suffered from ptsd from his military service but expert expert psychologists believed it to be more of a midlife crisis but either way no excuse for killing five people he also blamed it all on the crisis level he was at in 1971 being the loss of multiple jobs his wife's alcoholism and the siffy and that she was pressured <laughs> and sorry and she pressured and the siffy <laughs> And she pressured him into marriage by saying she was preggers when she wasn't. He also tried to blame it on his OCD that he only saw two solutions, accept welfare or kill his family and send their souls to heaven where he could later join them. Sure. Anyway, on April 12th, 1990, just before I was born. Mm. <sighs> You're going to hate this. Little dick list. <laughs> dick list. <laughs> I even wrote in. <laughs> in my notes. Dick list. Oh, he's a little dick. Was convicted of five counts of first degree murder. He denied responsibility for it, saying his mental state wasn't good at the time and he was unaccountable for what happened. Fuck off. How about that? Now, I just wanted to add this little bit in that the judge said because I was like, I like this gonna put it in. John Emil List is without remorse and without honor, he said. After 18 years, five months, and 22 days, it is now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Trisha, Frederick, and John F. List to rise from the grave. He imposed a sentence of five terms of life imprisonment to be served consecutively. The maximum permissible penalty at the time, I think. He had also never shown any remorse until an interview in 02, where he stated, I wish I had never done what I did. I've regretted my actions and prayed for forgiveness ever since. Oh, I also wanted to add that the 19 room mansion, Breeze Knoll, remained empty until August 1972 when it was destroyed by fire. Blaze was determined to be arson, but the culprit who said it was never caught. By 1974, the ruins had been cleared and a new home had been built on the site. No, thank you. Now, to end it off nicely, on March 21, 2008, Liz died of complications from pneumonia at the age of 82 while still serving his sentence in prison. And that's the story of John Emil, I cry when I jerk it, list. Good fucking riddance. Good fucking bye. I'm distracted by everything he said he was doing in the name of religion, right? Mm. Like, okay, first off, murder is not going to get you into heaven. Second of all, doing it based on greed and maybe pride. So there's like a bunch of like commandments that you are mm -hmm. breaking. Yeah. One thing I did find as well, which you'll get a little kick out of. I think at one point he tried to say that his confession shouldn't be used against him because that was for his pastor only. And that, you know, it's a... That's not how it works. Yeah, what's the thing where it's like just between Confessional, them? Confessional, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, mm, pretty sure that's not how things work, yeah, buddy. Yeah, because normally you don't write it down, you dumb fuck. What you mm. would normally do, and that's usually more of like a Catholic thing anyway, mm. is go into the confessional chamber and mm. then that's where you kind of mm. admit to your sins and ask for forgiveness for them. Yeah. All you did was confess what you did. Yeah, like I wonder how long did you have this planned for? You know what I mean? Oh, You're cool. Welcome. I didn't like him. No, he's a bit of a dick. Wait till you see the bust. I'm going to show you the bust. 
How about I show you now? Crazy, right? That is pretty spot on. Mm, like even down to the lines of like the... His puppet mouth. Is that what they call them? But yeah, thanks for tuning in, mung beans. Yeah, thanks, mung beans. And we will catch you on the full episode. I was about to say that. Oh. All right. Love you, bye. Love you, bye.